Welcome back to another round of Rastro Christi Community Nights, uh, where we focus together as a family on providing a space to ask questions, share doubts, unravel theological concepts, and generally get a grasp on what all the hullabaloo is about regarding Christians and Christianity. And of course, there's always that really entertaining portion of the evening when you get a chance to push my brain to the point of stroke with live Q&A. Um, but it's a privilege to be back and a treat looking out over the audience and seeing so many familiar faces. It's nice to see you too. Um, for those of you who are new, welcome, my name is Anna, and I'm your friendly neighborhood apologist. And if you're here this morning when Aaron was preaching, he talked about using um, spiritual emergency cards and having those emergency contacts. When you think about those emergency contact cards, remember that they usually have printed on them um, poison control automatically. I'm your spiritual poison control. So if you don't have your contact list built, don't worry, because there's already a pre-printed contact on there for you, and it's me. Alrighty? Um, what it means to be a Christian apologist is that I've devoted my life to teaching, training, and equipping folks like you with the reasons for why Christianity is objectively true, and why ignoring Christianity is the foundation for every thought, word, action, and decision you make, all the way down to even the most minuscule, is the worst possible thing you could do, literally ever. This is how serious this whole Christianity issue is. You don't have to already be a Christian to be one of my students. Um, in fact, these nights are designed in particular for folks who are not really sure they want to take Christianity seriously. So if you're someone who has a bone to pick with God, um, don't believe God exists, or just plain don't care either way, um, or maybe someone claiming to be a Christian has abused you for what they said were Christian reasons, and now you can't tell up from down or what Christianity is and what it isn't, well, then you're in the right place. And you're amongst good company. The space is for brokenness, hurt, and confusion. This is where any and all burning questions you have about the church, history, theology, you name it, I don't care. I want to hear about it. And if I can help you, I will. I know that's a tall order, but as you'll see shortly, it's easily the best part of the night because we get to experience the relief of healing in real time. Will you go ahead and switch slides for me, Grady? Truth never flees from scrutiny. When Jesus enters the synagogue at the beginning of his ministry years, he requests a scroll so that he might read from it. The scroll he requests is the prophet Isaiah, whose interaction with God occurred roughly 800 years prior to that point in history, and whose testimony begins with the invitation from the creator of the universe, come to me, let's reason together. The God to whom we Christians pray is not remote, he's not mad at you for having the audacity to doubt and question him. He's not mad at you for failing to comprehend him. He desires that you seek out his guidance and where you have doubts, questions, and concerns, they're not only welcome, they're expected. You're not an anomaly and there's no shame whatsoever in taking God up on the very thing he's invited us to do. Go ahead and put up the next one for me, love. He spent last year establishing, or we spent last year establishing how miraculous this book actually is, right? Christianity and all of its emphasis on the supernatural carries as the foundation of the faith, the word of God, okay? And if this is in fact the word of God, then we ought to expect that like God, it reflects supernatural attributes. And it does, objectively. There's no denying that this book has played the role of the most influential piece of literature the world has ever known. No other book comes anywhere near the contextual purity that this book carries, and that's not just an opinion of mine. By all literary standards, this book shouldn't exist. It's too old. But we're still pulling manuscripts out of rocks and clay jars and caves to this day, and it's continually demonstrating to the world the most internally consistent text we've ever seen. It's so striking that even the enemies of Christianity, scholars like Bart Ehrman, who have spent their entire career scrutinizing the Bible, recognize and admit openly that the Bible is shockingly reliable, unlike any other book in existence. Go ahead and swap plus slides for me. It's what you might expect if there were some supernatural power preserving it. Most of you carry with you a Bible app on your phone, which means so long as you have your phone on you, you carry a miracle. Okay, you carry some of the strongest historical evidence there is that Christianity is actually true. Did you know that? Do you understand the significance here? 
You don't have to be a Christian to recognize that Christianity makes a very bold claim. The very presence of this book in the world means that we must contend with a very, very serious reality. If this is the word of God, then God exists and you're not him. And that means that when God speaks to us, his words have an immediate application to our lives. Implicit to the acknowledgement of what's going on here with this book is that there is an expectation of relationship. God in his sovereignty has seen fit to speak to us. And not just speak, no, he's decided the best route for us is to write his words down so that we might be able to reference them later. And he's preserved his word in a way that does not change, it's permanent which means implicit to the acknowledgement of this book in the reality, we understand that these words apply to all people at all times, regardless of a change in cultural norms. And since that's implicit to the acknowledgement of this book, so too is the corollary issue, that there is an authority to whom we now recognizably are accountable. All of this simply by observing that this book appears in front of us and we haven't even opened it yet. Who is Jesus? Go ahead, Grady. The issue here at Loved Ones has never really been about whether or not the author of this book is God. Even the enemies of Christianity recognize that this book is keenly unnerving in its miraculous qualities. The issue is not that it exists. The issue is that it exists to speak into your life. The issue is that it exists to inform every thought decision, your purpose for breathing, everything. And that in it is the constant and incessant reminder that your life doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him, and he has plans for it. You've been born in an era that places a heavy emphasis on wanting to hear the words, you're awesome, everything is fine, and the great danger that you face is your failing to actualize your great potential to live your best life. But what this book says is quite different. No, actually, you're not awesome. At your very core, you're broken, and the rest of the world is too, and has been for quite some time. And the great danger that you face is that you would die and go to hell. The great danger is that you would spend your few moments here on Earth ignoring the content of this book and replacing it with something that sucks away your hours and your days and your years until it's too late and God gives to you what you have spent your hours, days, and years requesting to enter a place where you have said to him your entire life that you would like to be, somewhere he's not, somewhere where he does not try to speak into your life, somewhere where you can prioritize anything else but him, somewhere where you can ignore him permanently. And he's promised that if you insist on being separated from him that, you, that he will honor your request. He has no interest in forcing you to be with him for eternity if you don't want to be there. And what this book says is that although this great danger is looming, it's not a danger to us at all if we simply rest in his promise to bring us home. That if we trust the author of our souls, he will carry our brokenness home and he will heal it. But in order for him to carry us, we can't just mentally assent that he's standing there. We have to consent to be carried. We have to consent that we cannot carry ourselves. And in order to do that, we have to come to terms with the fact that we need him. And in order to come to those terms, we must admit that if we need him in our brokenness, and our brokenness extends all the way to our core, then the only way for him to heal us is to give ourselves to him to heal all the way to our core. And in so doing, we forfeit all that we are. Our lives in their entirety belong to the Savior, the one who will bring us home. All right, what else does this book have to say? Well, it tells us that the brokenness we experience now is due to a rebellion, being waged by an enemy who detests God and everything he stands for. This enemy knows his days are numbered and that his rebellion will be squelched easily and permanently by the Savior. And so he bides his time by manufacturing ways to stop you from allowing the Savior to pick you up. Everything and anything that will keep you from opening this book taking Christ seriously and seeing your life in reference to eternity as opposed to what you can get right now. And this enemy loves to accomplish his goals by mimicking the Savior, 
by trying to get you to follow frauds, by continually producing false saviors who promise salvation but deliver eternal death. This enemy knows what is going to happen to him and he doesn't want to be alone, so he's going to take as many people with him as he can get. We are warned over 15 times in the New Testament alone that we ought to be actively preparing to encounter this, that actually the enemy will choose to appear as an angel of light in order to deceive as many people as he possibly can. And that identifying him in his deception is easy if we just know our scriptures well enough. If we know what we're looking for. If we test the attempts at representing the Savior against the word of God. And since the word of God says that our Savior is is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then anyone presenting us with a Savior that is new or altered from the original is a fraud. See? Simple. Okay, so we need to know who the authentic savior is in order to be able to identify when someone comes along presenting to us a fraudulent alternative, right? When you're training to be a bank teller and you get to the part of the training where you're taught how to identify fake currency, do you know how they train you? You'd think they'd break out examples of different types of fake currency and show you the differences, have you study, maybe do a refresher course every now and then when new and better attempts become available and develop, but no, actually, that's not how they train you. They found there's a much more effective way of making certain that the fraudulent transactions are never made, and they do this by handing the trainees real money, authentic currency. Study this, ingrain this in your fingertips the way this feels, the weave of the cotton against your skin, how it folds, how it smells, where the watermarks are, where the holograms are. Because if you know better than anything what is authentic, then it doesn't matter what comes through that door. It doesn't matter how close the fraud gets. If it's any different than what has been ingrained in your fingertips, it's not real. And the transaction cannot be made. So let's do the same thing here, shall we? Let's ingrain the authentic Savior on our hearts and minds by studying him through God's word, because that's why this is here. Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you're my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, and let all God's angels worship him. And about the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You've loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy beyond your companions. And... In the beginning, Lord, you established the earth, and the heavens of the works of your your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like clothing. You will roll them up like a cloak, and they will be changed like clothing. But you are the same, and your years will never end. Now to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? For this reason, we must pay attention all the more to what we've heard so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles and distributions of gifts, from the Holy Spirit according to his will. Will you go up and put up the next slide, please, Grady? Who is Jesus? Well, according to this, he is the exact expression of God's nature. 
that all of the qualities of divinity are found in him, that he's worshiped, holy, perfect, sinless, just, of infinite value. You get the idea. And that previously God was using prophets, but now he's using Jesus as the culmination of that role. So we should expect that the qualities of a prophet are present when we think of Jesus. It's just that they've been dialed up significantly. Where prophets speak God's word, Jesus is the word. And here too, this says he has made the final purification of sin. That's the role of a priest. Where God had previously been using priests to mediate the relationship between God and his people, speaking on our behalf, to God and constantly reconciling our relationship through sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, God has now sent Jesus, his permanent high priest, as the sacrifice. The last sacrifice, the only sacrifice. And here too, this says that Jesus is enthroned. That's the role of a king. Previously God had used kings, but now he sends the king whose authority does not extend throughout geographical Israel, but whose authority extends to all of heaven and earth, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is king of heaven and of earth. Right now, as we speak, as well as throughout all of time, right? I think so. You don't need to trust me, let's look. In the beginning, Gospel of John was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him and apart from him, not one thing was created that was created. And in him was life and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness and yet the darkness did not overcome it. And here, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yeah, that's Jesus. Have the ramifications of this ever really sunk in for you? If Jesus is the king now, and he has always been king, then that means that every human being that has ever lived has bowed or will bow before his throne. You can put up the next slide, Greedy. This means that in the fourth century BC, when Siddhartha Gautama Buddha rejected the caste system in northern India and began teaching the Four Noble Truths, and the nine virtues that would become the foundation for a religion held by roughly 500 million people alive right now. Go ahead and put up the next slide. And when he contracted food poisoning at 80 years old and closed his eyes for the last time, they did not reopen in the ether of nirvana. They opened inside of a head bowed to the ground before the throne of Jesus. Can you put up the next slide, please? This means that in Saudi Arabia, on Monday the 8th of June in 632, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, at 62 years old and suffering from Medinian fever, closed his eyes, trying to recover in the, white, in the lap of his wife, Aisha, and opened them nowhere near Jannah, or the Garden of Paradise, but rather bowed to the ground before the throne of Jesus. And so too, will the 1.8 billion Muslims worldwide who have chosen to follow Muhammad. Can you put up the next slide, Grady? And so will you, and so will I. Who is Jesus? Next slide, Grady. He's our source for knowledge. He speaks and is the word of God so that our ignorance may be dealt with. He is our sustainer. He reconciles and is our reconciliation to God so that our sin might be dealt with. He is our goal. He reigns so that our destiny might be dealt with. He is the Christ, the anointed one. Christ is not his last name. Christ means anointed. It's a title. Uniting the three anointed positions that God has outlined as necessary to fix the brokenness of his creation and redeem them back into being in communion with him as was the original design. Prophet, priest, king. Next slide, ready. And if he is all of these things, and if this book is accurate, then the necessary conclusion here, if we follow the logic, is that he's then our Messiah. 
the requirement for maintaining justice. He's the one who has volunteered to take on to himself our sentencing. When you and I act in a way that is unholy, no matter how small we think of it, we have done, what we've done is an action that God cannot permit in his presence. We've soiled ourselves. Where God is clean and pure perfection, we've become dirty. A little bit of dirt, lots of dirt, it doesn't matter because any amount of dirt makes us unclean or impure. Remember our rules of logic from last year. God cannot be both pure and impure at the same time and in the same sense. Therefore, logically, a separation must be made between where God dwells and where we dwell. And God has to dwell apart from our dirtiness until we can figure out a way to get washed clean again. When you and I act in a way that is unholy, we also act in a way that is contrary to God's nature, his character, and his attributes. When we break God's laws, we're not breaking something that is arbitrary or random. He didn't make up these laws just to test us or frustrate us. God says, do not lie, because he cannot lie. Because perfect holiness does not lie. When he calls himself the truth, it's, because, it's not because he's arrogant. It's because that is actually what he is. And he cannot choose to be otherwise. Because again, remember the laws of logic from last year, God cannot be both God and not God at the same time and in the same sense. It's impossible for him to break character. When we sin, we are in actuality blaspheming God's character, who and what he is. We are offending him. And if we are offending an infinite being, then the value of our offense is also infinite. When someone who's broken the law, a criminal, sits before a judge, justice is not served until the guilty party has served their sentence. In our case, we're criminals in that we've broken God's laws. And God is required in his holiness and perfect justice to execute the sentence of separation from his presence. And since the value of our criminality is infinite, the penalty for our criminality is also infinite. Go ahead and change slides for me. And if that's confusing, I'm gonna go ahead and give you an illustration so that you understand what I'm talking about. A lot of times, petty offenses in our country don't require that you have to serve any time in jail, right? More often than not, the penalty is that you just have to pay a fine. You've broken a law, in so doing, you've offended a society. You now owe a debt to that society. And therefore, you, your payment to that society is owed. Sometimes it's $1,000. Other times, it's 1,000 hours of volunteer work. Either way, it's finite in that there is an end to it. A human being can pay back the debt. Okay, so now let's apply this to God. Where society creation, human beings are finite. We have boundaries and we have limits. He, God, is the opposite of us. He is infinite, boundless, impossible to measure. We have broken his law. In so doing, we have offended the infinite. So now we owe a debt to the infinite, and therefore we must pay our fine of infinite debt. How do you pay a fine of infinity debt? How can a finite human being ever produce or offer anything that would satisfy a penalty with no limits? If you're a student with loans, this is it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The answer is we can't. We're unable in any way, shape, or form to pay the debt that we owe. And so is the case for everyone else, regardless of their religious belief, how they were born, when they were born, it doesn't matter. We're all in exactly the same predicament. When we die, we will find ourselves before the throne of Jesus, the infinite and perfect judge. We will be identified as the criminals we are, and the verdict that will be rendered by the judge is guilty and rightly so because it's true. We are guilty, and we know it. And then the sentencing will come because we're unable to pay the debt we've accrued in our guilt, and that sentence will be separation from God for infinity, or as the Bible puts it, for eternity. Next slide, please. But then something unexpected will happen. To those of us who have consented to believing God's pleads, 
to listen to him and place our lives in his hands to carry home, he's going to say this. You have been found guilty, but your sentence has been served and your debt has been paid in full. For I am the word of God. As such, I am of infinite value. I am the Christ, the fulfillment of all the promises God has made through time, the prophets, the priests, and the kings to bridge the gap and fix what has been broken to be the representative of mankind, a second Adam who does not plunge you into brokenness. I am the son of God, begotten, not made, through whom and for whom you were created. I am the son of man, and as such, I have felt the pain and suffering that you've experienced, and I have walked out on earth the path that you could not, fulfilling every expectation and every law reflected in God's character, and I did so perfectly, thus fulfilling all holiness. As your mediator, I have spoken on your behalf that you took me at my word that you did not ignore my pleas, and that you trusted in me in such a way that you placed your thoughts, actions, decisions, all that you are to your core, in my hands to direct. And that you consented to have me carry you because you believed me when I told you you won't be able to do any of this yourself. And so as the judge, so too I am the Messiah. And carry you I will. My sacrifice is enough and my word is good. And with the authority I have been given both in heaven and on earth as your king, I pardon you and transfer your sentence onto myself to pay. I've washed away every speck of dirt from you and declared you clean, welcome home. Come and let me show you what I've prepared for you and experience the joy you've been yearning for this whole time. Who is Jesus? He's our savior. You cannot remove any of these titles or characteristics from him or else he ceases to possess the ability to save us. Anna, why can't Jesus just be a guy? Because a guy won't save you. He must be the Christ, the anointed one, prophet, priest, king, the only mediator between God and mankind, uncreated, eternal, God in flesh, righteous judge, holy, pure, this Jesus and no other will save you. Jesus Christ, Son of God, our Savior. In Greek, that would be Jesus Christos Theouias Soter. You only ever go to seminary so that you can show off Greek when you're standing up here talking to people. Or the acronym, Ichthus. <laughs> Good job, Grady. Oh, uh, so that's where the Jesus fish came from. Yeah. <laughs> Ichthus. The symbol was originally used as a silent way of identifying converted Roman centurions during Nero's persecution. It was an underground railroad of sorts. The ichthus is simply two arcs placed opposite one another. So when you're trying to identify if you're speaking with a soldier who is either going to arrest you or get you out of town safely, you can't outright tell him you're a Christian. So instead you shuffle your feet a little bit in front of you in the sand and you form an arc. And if he is an unbeliever, he's none the wiser because there's nothing particularly odd about someone shuffling restlessly in front of a soldier of the empire. But if he is a believer, he too can shuffle in the same way, silently completing the ichthus and alerting the person in front of him that he will rescue them to safety without alerting any of his brothers as to his intentions. Next slide. The ichthus is the symbolic representation of the spread of the gospel to the point of death. The outward identification of the scores upon scores of believers who came before us who did pay the cost of identifying as a Christian in arenas where they were slaughtered for the entertainment of the state. But we know it best as a bumper sticker. And if that isn't a commentary on the state of the modern American church, I don't know what is. How much darker is it now knowing this, when we see this symbol mocked with the addition of two small feet and the word Darwin across the center. The enemy adores mimicry. Remember my two rules. There is a God and you are not him, and Satan is not very creative. He doesn't seem to enjoy invention. 
he would much rather take the truth and bend it a little. There's a reason why we teach that genuine discernment is not the ability to tell the difference between right and wrong. Anybody can do that. But that genuine discernment is being able to tell the difference between right and almost right. To be sensitive to how the standard is being twisted ever so slightly. And to do the work of moving it back into shape. And if we're being warned that in our topic tonight, for example, Jesus, uh, that the enemy will repeatedly attempt to mimic him and bend the truth about who he is slightly in some cases and slightly more in others, then we who have ingrained the authentic savior in our fingertips will be able to identify the fraud immediately. So let's test it. Next slide, please, Grady. Here's a list of some of the most well-known alternative Christ claimants from contemporaries of Jesus himself all the way to right now. So this is people that actually claim to be the Messiah that's different from this. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but I did want you to see the fact that not only are these frauds turning up in every generation, but they're also turning up across all cultures as well. We can go ahead and put the second list up. There we go. Both male and female and representative of all ethnicities are up there, so there's no escaping being exposed to alternatives to the real Christ. In fact, allow me to introduce you to my current favorite. Next slide. This is Sergei Antolayevich Torop otherwise known as Vissarion, which in Russian means he who gives life. Sergei is a former Red Army soldier and worked as a traffic cop right up to the fall of the USSR in 1989, at which point he realized that he was not, in fact, a Soviet officer, but was the Christ, and so founded the Church of the Last Testament. He has a fairly significant following. Um, go ahead and show up the next slide, would you, Grady? Boasting estimates is about 50,000, um, several on Instagram many of whom have chosen to live with him permanently in the 83 communes spread out throughout Siberia. If you're a college student in one of my classes, one of my big goals is to get us to Siberia so that we can do evangelism. He does not grant interviews normally, but for whatever reason, seven years ago now, he allowed the Vice Channel to come meet with him personally. Um, I have my students watch this documentary once every couple of years just to get an idea. I can't help but feel that there is something ironic about a reporter for the channel that's called Vice, being the only one allowed in to interview him. But perhaps it's just a coincidence. Uh, go ahead and do the next slide, Grady. From what little we have to glean from him, he teaches a blending of Buddhism, Taoism, and Russian-style Catholicism in a third installment of the scriptures that he's written himself um, called The Last Testament. And actually, it's pretty popular in Germany right now. Uh, but we have yet to see reports of him raising anybody from the dead. Although, if you're quick, and I checked kayak this morning, uh, there are still flights available to Russia, and you can make it in time for the largest event on their liturgical calendar. It's a feast day, and it's next Sunday, where you can pilgrimage to his throne in the woods. And maybe, just maybe, he will descend the mountain and gift you with a message or a selfie. You want to show him? There you go. Oh, and ladies. There's a particular set of religious experiences reserved just for you if you're willing to join he and his followers in the communes. So if Tinder's not your cup of tea, there is always this option. And this is the best part. You get your own tiny wooden hut. Can we show them? Who doesn't want a she shed on the Mongolian border? All I'm saying is it's an option. That's all I'm saying. OK. <laughs> This is real. This is real. All right, Anna, but what about some less obvious examples of fraudulent Christ? Yes, we have those too. Usually what happens is that the enemy repackages and redistributes old issues that Christians in centuries past have dealt with and worked through. So he recycles a lot. If he isn't creative, then he's going to repeat himself and hope we don't notice. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Case in point, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Can we show them Arius? brilliant. In a nutshell, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach Arianism, which is what the Council of Nicaea was originally convened to deal with. Arius was the son of a Phoenician merchant and who 
when he read the Gospels for the first time, determined that they could not be accurate, and so he ripped out portions of the text that he didn't like, and he began preaching from the altered text that Jesus is not divine. He's just a guy. He's not God in flesh. And that, in fact, Jesus, although very important, and indeed the promised Messiah, could only be a man and nothing else. Well, fast forward 1,700 years to the present, and we have the same teaching, just nuanced with some modern flair. Go ahead and change slides for me, Grady. Not only is Jesus not eternal, but we are actually mistaking him because he is in actuality Michael the Archangel, and who has been present reigning on the earth since 1914, which was when he came back for his second coming. And the reason most of us missed it was because it was invisible. But that's all right, because God does not speak this, his word. Rather, he speaks to a governing body of men in New York, who then place what he told them into tracts called watchtowers to guide his people. Also, you need to know that God's word has not been preserved through time. You don't want to open this book. Rather, you need an altered Bible called a New World Translation, so that you don't get confused along with their materials. Very good. Oh, and just one more thing. They've noticed that if you ignore what they've told you and you go ahead and you read this book, that you will, in fact, end up a Christian, and they don't want that. Can we put up the warning? So make certain you don't ever actually read the Word of God outside of the context of their influence. You might inadvertently become a Christian. Okay, Anna, well, what about the Mormons? You said in your teaser trailer that they were also teaching an alternative Jesus. What's going on there? Well, first, I'll put up one of the more recent presidents acknowledging openly that the Mormon Christ and the Christ of Christianity are distinctly different. Thank you. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints teaches that since the Bible regularly disagrees with the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, it's because it's not been translated accurately and that you really need to concern yourself with those points of contention because we have the culmination of God's word to us in his new revelation of the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and Doctrines and Covenants. We also still have living prophets who regularly address our people like Hinckley here. So don't worry about it. Instead, we want you to follow the teachings of a young man who claimed, to have been vi who claimed to have been visited by an angel where he was given the location of a set of gold plates upon which the history of God's people in the Americas is documented and to whom Jesus Christ appeared after that whole ordeal in Jerusalem. And that upon studying this new revelation and following the corollary teachings of Joseph Smith and the prophets that came after him, like Brigham Young, you will learn that actually there are lots of gods and that you yourself, if you live according to these precepts, that you too will become a god or goddess in your own right. And when you ascend to godhood, you get your own planet to oversee. Actually, that's not true. Only men get planets. But ladies, you're allowed to come along if you're married to one of them. The god of this planet, for example, had his own god, who had his own god at one point, and so on and so forth. Our god and his goddess wife, who dwell right now somewhere near a star named Kolob, they, when they first ascended to godhood, began their primary duty as gods, a duty you will share, and that is to produce spirit children. How does one produce spirit children? I'll let the moms and dads in here explain how that process works on their drive home. But for our purposes, let's just say that they're successful and they create two brothers. The first is Jesus, and the second is Satan. After that, they created all of us. Which means that when Mormons say that Jesus is our brother, they mean it literally. But this is just our spirits we're talking about. Our bodies still need to be made, and that's where we come in. It is the duty of obedient Mormons to get married and produce as many bodies as they can in order to house the spirit children waiting to be born. 
there's a logic behind those really big families you encounter. And in fact, if you take this reasoning all the way to the necessary conclusion, the most efficient way to produce as many Mormon bodies as possible would be to have multiple wives through whom to accelerate the process. And presumably, the younger the wife, the better, because she'll be able to get started as soon as possible. When we turn on the news, and they're covering FLDS compounds being raided and finding elementary school age girls preparing to become mothers, what we are seeing is not some radicalized form of belief. What we are seeing is the consistent and historical application of what Joseph Smith and many of his subsequent prophets taught and practiced themselves. And I'll let Joseph Smith summarize this for you. Here's an excerpt from one of his more famous sermons. This is the King Follett Discourse. God is in the still small voice. In all of these affidavits, indictments, it is all of the devil, all corruption. Come on, ye prosecutors, ye false swearers. All hell boil over, ye burning mountains roll down your lava. For I will come out on the top at last. I have more to boast of than ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. Your preacher starts talking like that. It's time to go. But Anna, you keep harping on us that the enemy is not creative, and yet this set of beliefs, this is outright bizarre in many aspects. Of all the things we've talked about, this one appears to be quite unique. How is this a rebranding of anything that has happened before that we can reference or track? Well, let me show you. We have before us the story of a man who has an encounter with an angel who gives him a new book that is supposed to clarify and add to the scriptures that the Jews and Christians use. This book, along with the teachings of the prophet, are to be understood as the final authority on all things. That salvation only comes through the affirmation that the prophet has given an accurate testimony the result of which is the reinstitution of a theocracy, theocratic militias, and the addition of the practice of polygamy. And if you live your life in submission to the prophet and his teachings, the men are promised an eternity of sex. Sound familiar yet? Mormonism is Islam for Americans. And it's interesting that people like me have been saying this for years. Will you put up the picture for me? And not two months ago, This video went viral. An Islamic family and a Mormon family tracking together how easy it was to coexist because their theology was so similar. Who is Jesus? Go ahead and put that up. Each one of these examples teaches and uses the name Jesus Christ, but none of them are Christian. It's not enough for someone to simply acknowledge the name Jesus Christ. It's not enough to use the name Jesus Christ and remove the meaning behind the name. The mere words, Jesus and Christ, do not save us. It's the object of our faith who saves, the only one who can save us, this Jesus. And not any of the myriads of false Jesuses that will inevitably come through our doors. A piece of brass may shine, but lacking the king's image, it will not pass as currency. A man may shine with moral virtues, but lacking the image of Christ Jesus, consisting in infinite holiness, he will not pass his currency on the day of judgment. And it is his word, and not my creaky voice, that has the power to pierce the soul. Right? Let's take a look. Let's do Luke chapter 9, 18 through 20. While Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and still others that you're one of the ancient prophets that has come back. And you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you're God's Messiah. Ichthus, do you know him? Is his image on you? And if you're someone here tonight who does not have access to a physical copy of the Word of God, or if you're a Jehovah's Witness, 
that you've never had access or the opportunity to pour over the word of God on your own apart from the New World Translation, then I'm going to give you one of mine. Just ask me. Do you know who Jesus is? Welcome back to Russia Christi Community Nights. Let's open up for some Q&A. Uh, yes, can you talk about um, praying people into the Mormon heaven? Like baptism of the dead? Correct. Yes, so one of the practices in Mormonism, uh, and one of the reasons why Ancestry.com, for example, did you know that's run by the Mormons? The reason why there is an emphasis on Ancestry is because for them, what do you do when you don't have Joseph Smith? What happens if you died prior to hearing the testimony of Joseph Smith? You don't have access to what saves you which is that testimony. So what they started to do is baptize in the name of people who have died. They've started tracking backwards, getting names, and then going to baptismal fonts and having someone step in in your place, take on your name, and affirm the testimony of Joseph Smith so that they can, you can be baptized a Mormon and that you can be saved. And I believe that's what you're referencing. Yes, yep, yep. There was a lawsuit a few years ago between Holocaust survivors and um, their family members because they were finding out about this and that, that is completely, they, they, they sued the church because they said, we don't want anything to do with that and how dare you baptize our ancestors into the church. And so there's a rule that they can baptize anybody else but you can't do survivors of the Holocaust or their family members. There's many cults out there, obviously some you've addressed. Why do you think so many people get drawn into them? Good. So, we specialize, and I myself am a cult and new religion specialist. That's my primary role with our global ministry. So besides being your apologist in general, that's what I do for all of our apologists, is make sure they're trained in that material. Um, what happens when you get drawn into things like this is a process called undue influence. And it's different from brainwashing in that in brainwashing, you've, you've heard that term brainwashing before, right? In brainwashing, what happens is you go into a scenario where you are usually being tortured. And the difference between brainwashing and undue influence is that in brainwashing, you know who your enemy is and you desperately want relief. And so you will say and do anything over and over and over again in order to get that relief. And the reason there's a difference is because usually when you take someone, a victim out of that scenario and out of that environment, they return to their primary identity. The enemy is gone, they're no longer in danger, and they revert back to previous beliefs in spite of whatever they may have said or written or done while they were under the traumatic experience. But with undue influence, it's the same exact process, a type of psychological torture in which you do not know who the enemy is. The person is perceived as a friend or a mentor or a guru or a spiritual leader. And in so doing, what ends up happening is that through a process of usually how it works is um, lack of sleep, uh, they remove a steady, a steady diet and they start tracking every single point in your, in your day. You'll notice that with like the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, if you ever look at their cards and how they map out their day, there's not a minute set aside for themselves. In Mormonism, they remove all access to information. So you're not even allowed to hear from somebody like me or scrutinize. Um, they, behave, they control your behavior, your information, your thinking, and your emotion. It's called a bite model. It's something that we track as psychologists. Um, and that's how they place you into a place where it's traumatic enough, where you desire relief, and the best way you can get that relief is by performing. And the reason why it's dangerous is because they perceive their performance for a friend as opposed to what it actually is, is somebody taking advantage of them for money or for sex or for anything. That's what these cults usually do. Um, and so when you remove them from that environment, they maintain their identity as the cult member, and that's what makes it so difficult and why it's hard, so hard to get them out. But that's part of what I do is exit counseling. There's been many people I've talked to over the years, and like the Baja faith and all these other, and they're like, well, they're nice people. And, and, and most of the people I've talked to really have not pursued Lord uh, independently on their own. So they find somebody that's sort of nice. They talk about God. They talk about Jesus. I mean, even new age. I yeah. mean, just, you know, uh, there's just so many that people say, well, they're nice people. It can't be bad. So that's just been a very awkward thing because obviously people, these people aren't discerning of the spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit. So that, it's just awkward. It's hard to bring people to truth when they see other things, they're like, well, you know, what are you offering that these people aren't? 
Yeah, perception oftentimes with these groups is very different from reality. And what they, I mean, all, case in point, Scientology. Um, it looks all pretty, and they, they get you with their, their entrance stuff, and they show you all these celebrities that are part of it, and they look happy. But you get into it, and it's complete and total hell. It's slavery. And in fact, if you try to leave, they're allowed to kill you. And that's particularly dangerous, especially if they're threatening their, your family members as well. And a lot of people don't know that. Um, Leah Remini has done an excellent job coming out of Scientology. She does, I recommend it highly. It's on A&E. I think the next season's coming up in September. Um, but review those. It's, it's eye-opening. I mean, these, this comes from a man, L. Ron Hubbard, who, from what we can tell, was suffering from rapid onset schizophrenia um, and who basically removed everyone off onto a ship that was following him and said to them, essentially, the best way to make money is to start a religion. And I say that, I'm quoting him. Um, so it's very much about money. And you'll see that if you ever try to buy any of their materials. Um, cults are legit, and it's very dangerous, and there is relief for you. And if you have family members who are caught in this and want out, or you know that they're being abused but don't know how to say anything about it, um, there are resources, and I'm one of them. So I can help you if I can. Yep. Hey, Anna. Yeah, same. Uh, what's your response if someone says, I'll grant you Jesus even as the Bible describes him, right? They won't, don't want to argue with that. But if he's infinitely valuable and he died to make atonement for our sins, why can't that just cover everyone? Why do I have to personally believe or do anything if he's already covered that sacrifice. Right, so there's a trust element in the scriptures. God doesn't want God doesn't want you to be forced to be with him and we talked about that for a minute. Part of that not desiring you to for, be forced to be, he wants you to choose to want to be with him. And in order for that process to happen, there has to be a part of you that is allowed to say I want you or I don't want you. And so, although Jesus' sacrifice is big enough and wide enough to cover everyone, in Christianity we teach it's only effective for the people who have said to God, yeah, I do want you, because he's not going to force you to be with him. So even the mental acknowledgement that Jesus is unique and that his sacrifice is all there and all present, that's true. And I would say to them, yeah, you've got it dead on, so what's, what's stopping you from taking the plunge, essentially? What's stopping you from actually saying to God, yeah. I would like to take you up on this offer. Yes, I recognize that I can't do this myself. Um, that's what's critical about Christianity. And what's interesting about grace is that it's a foreign concept to most of us. We like lists. Human beings like to hear, do A, B, C, D, E. And if you hit all of those things, you're good. And if you don't, you're not, because it makes sense. And we go, oh, well, okay, I failed at C, so I guess I get to start over again. Does that make sense? But for, for an infinite holy God to stand there and say, no, there's absolutely nothing you can do to do this. It's, it's all me, and I want you, and I love you. That's so foreign that I think people tend to, to, to desire to go back to the lists, to desire to go back to the actions that we can see. And then it's interesting, because Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the highest amount of conversion from Jehovah's Witnesses out of Jehovah's Witness belief is into Roman Catholicism, where we have lots of lists. Just going back to uh, the cult question and then also tying in the last question. Mm -hmm. People who come out of cults, such as Leah Remini, mm -hmm. um, she obviously has a trust issue with religion, and I don't believe she claims to be Christian. Mm -hmm. um, is that typical of somebody coming out of occultism? Absolutely. You're abused so much by people who claim to be the pinnacle of religiosity. Um, human beings are what comprise every single one of these religions. Abuse is going to occur. And Christians experience abuse on a regular basis by other Christians. There are people claiming to be Christian. There are people claiming a lot of labels that aren't actually applying to them. And so we must constantly go back to the source and say, you know, you're absolutely dead on to be worried and not trusting of people. I'm not either. We're all sinners. That's part of the reason why this book is here. But you can trust Christ. What does Christ have to say? Read it for yourself, that sort of thing. So I usually, when somebody is dealing with, with trust issues coming out, I say, no problem. Totally understand. Very rational. That's okay. Why don't you just handle talking to Jesus on your own for a while? And I'll be here if you need me. Does that help? 
Hey, <clears throat> excuse me. When we're talking about witnesses as a group, would you mind speaking on what happens if you leave the Jehovah's Witness Church after accepting baptism? Yes. So if you're baptized as a Jehovah's Witness, the process of leaving the church is called being disfellowshipped. Um, so as a Christian, you're allowed to, to get up and go out and attend as many different churches as you like. And we're all, we all talk to each other. We all believe the same thing about Jesus. We just look a little different and we run our services a little differently. And we're allowed to because Romans 14 gives us the liberty to do that. That's why it, they're called denominations of Christianity and not alternative religions. So when we get to the Jehovah's Witnesses, that's not true. The Jehovah's Witness religion is the end all and the only way that you're saved and how it looks, how you act, how you're dressed. You'll notice everybody kind of has the same t way of speaking when they come to your door. By the way, when Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door, that is literally free evangelism. Invite them in. Have a conversation. It's totally worth it. I recommend it highly. Um, it is. It's, it's wonderful. It's how, how better to do evangelism than in your pajamas on a Saturday morning? I mean, if I can stand there with my coffee cup and my Bible and go, yeah, okay, let's talk about Jesus. I mean, that's amazing. Um, but what happens when you become baptized as a Jehovah's Witness, you're in it. I mean, you are in it. There is no, there's no questioning. There's no doubt. You are not even allowed to seek out information that is critical of the Jehovah's Witnesses at all. And if you ever want to see this process, I can show you. Um, I've had several people witness it in my office um, when I get out the testimony of one of the governing body members that left when he found out that they were lying. He got elected as a governing body member. He came in ready to hear from God directly. God didn't show up. And he went, you're all lying, and left and wrote a book and gave the entire rundown of how it was, and I get it out. It's marvelous. It's called Crisis of Conscience. It's incredible. I highly recommend reading it. Um, I get that book out, and as soon as they see the name, because everybody knows the name of their governing body members, as soon as they see the name, it's all as though it's holy water and I'm gonna throw it on them. Like there's no, they won't speak to me anymore, they'll start backing out of my office, very uncomfortable, because they're not supposed to scrutinize at all. You're not even supposed to use anything other than jw.org. And so when you do something that is against what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach, it becomes a fatal action the result of which is expulsion from the group, such that you are not ever allowed to speak again to any of the members of the group, which means if your entire family are Jehovah's Witnesses, you will never see or hear from them again. There's no way to get access to them, and they are not to access you because what they are told by their overseers is that this, this process and this pain that you're about to put, say, your child through, for example, that happens regularly, this pain you're about to put your child through, this is a disciplinary pain, and they're gonna go out and they're gonna find out just how bad it is, and they're gonna come running back. And so the parents stay hands off forever. It's very sad, very serious. And Jehovah's Witnesses in our community who have experienced this need us the most. It's absolutely crucial that we reach out to them and let them know it doesn't matter if you agree with me. You're a member of this community, and you're not going to be ignored. Could you um, talk a little bit about the undergarments that the LDS wear and what the symbols on them mean? Yes. Yes. Have you guys ever been to any LDS services or anything? Anybody? No. So what happens when a, a temple opens in your, in your area? They open it up for, I mean, this is that beautiful, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, when you see them like singing at Christmas time, for example, that, those, that beautiful space in Utah. They have little temples all around the country and across the globe. And what happens is, is that access to that place, access to the church is restricted to just Mormons. But there's an exception because what they want to show the community when they start, when they've taken enough time and enough money to build one where you are is they'll open it up to the public for two weeks and you're allowed to see the outer areas to see how beautiful it is. And it is, it's, it's incredibly beautiful. Um, and that's on purpose. Um, but the inner sanctum you're never allowed to see because you're not a Mormon. And once the two weeks are up, the doors close, and you do not have access to what happens in there anymore. Um, so part of that process as a Mormon, um, there's like, there's actually a secret handshake as well, but there's a, there are things that you do as a Mormon that earmark you as part of that belief, and one of them are temple garments. 
and what temple garments are, are clothes that you wear underneath your street clothes that identify you as a Mormon. Um, there are also, there's lots of secret ceremonies that identify you as a Mormon and, and as you ascend to godhood, that, that kind of process, and one of them is what she's referencing, the temple garments. You have to actually go to a special places um, to purchase these, and it's like, like imagine you walking into Victoria's Secret, and then like in the back, and I'm not kidding, this is real, um, and in the back there's a curtain, and it's like, says for Mormons only, and there's like a secondary, that's what you can do. Um, if you Google, I think they still have some of the old websites up that first sprouted up when the internet came um, into being, and you can see what temple garments look like, because those old sites haven't been taken down yet. Um, they kind of look like turn of the century bathing suits. I think that's a, probably the best way to describe them. But that's a critical component. I was asked, back when Mitt Romney was running for president, I was asked if he had temple garments on while he was doing his debates, and the answer is yes, <laughs> he did. <laughs> Absolutely. So, there are lots of special things. When you get married, you're married for eternity, obviously, right? Your marriage covenant doesn't end, because if you're going to ascend to godhood, um, you have to be married all the way into eternity. And so when you get married in the temple, that's a sealing ceremony. That's why you're not allowed to go to Mormon weddings if you're not a Mormon. There's a sealing ceremony that happens. Um, and the spouses uh, give each other sacred names that only the other ones know so that in eternity, they can call to each other and find each other. And it's only the names that they know. There's actually a massive problem that's happening right now with the church in that they've allowed, they've started to allow divorces because that's a very modern thing to do and the church, the LDS church is desperate to be as modern as possible to look as Christian denomination-y as they possibly can, but what they don't talk about is the amount of trauma that happens when you say, divorce your spouse over abuse here, and you realize you're a Mormon, and that means you're married to that person for eternity, so although you've separated from the abuse on earth, you're about to spend eternity with your abuser or the problem of remarrying, because what happens if you're married for eternity? You get a divorce here. Your spouse then marries again. That's also for eternity. So now we have the problem of recognizing that not only are you going to be married to this person for eternity, but you're also in a polygamous marriage for eternity. And the amount of trauma and the amount of counseling that has to go on trying to process those thoughts. Can you imagine? How much darker is it now when you turn on TLC and you see sister wives playing? Okay, this is serious stuff. Very, very sad. I actually, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. Okay. My, my, whole, my whole teen years and all the way through, born into it. Welcome, thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and, like, I just wanted to, you know, and a few of the people mentioned they wondered what it was like or whatever. And I yeah. Just, it's very fear-based. Okay. In, in, like, I never thought of God as, like, a, a loving God. I was just scared. So, um, you know, like, you have to go out in service, which you have to go several times a week. And you have to fill out a time card and everything. And so that was pretty horrifying as a kid. Even being born into it, I always felt like it wasn't right, like something wasn't right about it. You know, we weren't allowed to um, go to college. Um, so I never knew I could be anything. Like I never had any aspirations because of that. Um, so after I graduated from high school and I met my husband now, um, that's when I got you know, away from it. And like, I've been able to baptize my parents and my sister and my other family members have actually left. But I just wonder, because I feel like I have brothers and sisters, three of them, and I don't feel like they want anything to do with religion anymore. And even though I've been a Christian for like 30 years, like, and, and feel like I'm trying to be a good influence, I just wonder like, what's the best way to help them to see Jesus as not religious, but as loving, yeah. even though I feel like I try to do it all the time. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, that's perfect. So living your Christianity is incredible and absolutely 
exceptionally powerful. Um, and powerful in ways that you may not even realize, that you may not ever see. Um, the sheer fact that you're willing to talk to them about it or make yourself available to talk about Jesus and who you've encountered and why he's important is absolutely crucial. Um, if you ever get a point to a point with your family members and they want to know more about you know, what they actually had to deal with and see references, see old, you know, a, a New World Translation, for example, back when they were first issued, or like um, or look at the Greek and see how, how serious the Christians have been about making sure that they know that this is not the real Jesus and why it matters. Um, I found that that is usually the best way because they're so information hungry that they don't realize they need it until it's in front of them and suddenly it'll just explode into this, you know, nights long conversation. I ha just had the privilege of um, helping through uh, the process of exit counseling a, a young woman who has just been disfellowshipped um, in our community. Incredibly intelligent human being, um, very confused as to how this book works but wants to know more about what was there. And what was beautiful about this interaction is that I really, I. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I got to sit and listen, and then all I did was say, you realize that, that, that the Jesus that you're talking about is different from my Jesus in this way. We didn't even, there was no argument, there was no anything, and she just, she was so kind to me, um, and just sat there and listened, and it's been extremely, extremely powerful. The other thing that's positive is, um, there's a wonderful book out there called 30 Years of Watchtower Slave, and it's written by a, a young woman who, has decided that her calling is to just talk to Jehovah's Witnesses who've come out and are confused and what's going on. Um, and let me get you, make sure you talk to me afterwards because there's another book that I have too. Um, that can be extremely powerful as well just to find out that there are other people just like them. I went to Johnson University, okay. Johnson Bible College at the time when, after I met him and we became Christians. Well, I did. Um, and it wasn't until I was there that I actually watched a video and realized that I'd been in a cult my whole life. Like, I had no idea. I just thought I was in, like, right. a different religion. Right. So I had no idea. And, mm -hmm. and I still think, even though, like, my mom is a Christian now, I can still see that there is a lot of those, like, there's a lot that still haunts her from that. Right, because they've stolen your life. many years later, yes. Yeah, they've stolen your life yes. through lies in order to make money. Um, tell your story. That is one of the most powerful things you can ever do. Tell your story. Thank you for that. Marvelous. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm right here. Sorry. Oh, hi. Hello. <laughs> hi. I was wondering, when you were talking about the slight bending of the truth and the enemy's work, mm -hmm. How much do you think that is happening in the churches on every corner that are not the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the ones that we think of maybe as different? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about the variety of denominations that sure. maybe many of us were raised in sure. or still are in. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think about the enemy's work there? Yeah, the, the, the church, it's our job to, to respond to the culture. That's what we do. That's what the church is here for. What's why we're on earth. Why did God wake me up this morning? It's to evangelize. Well, why? Because the culture is changing and Jesus doesn't. And so we're constantly, that's part of the role of apologetics and, and persuasion is that as active participants in this culture and understanding the culture, we can then understandably counter the culture with what they need for the truth. And what we're seeing happening in a lot of churches um, the New Apostolic Reformation, for example, has this problem uh, a lot right now. You're seeing this happen with um, Bethel, for example. They're kind of imploding right now with this. Um, and it's that they have, they have gotten so close to the culture and gotten so far removed from who Jesus is because they were trying to get people in the door and they were trying to keep them in the seats. And the best way they thought they could do that were marketing strategies and making sure nobody ever felt uncomfortable because that seemed like that was the right thing to do. And it's been happening for so long now that the people's emotions towards the beautiful music and towards the, the sermons that were not focused on opening this, but were rather focused on um, 
making sure you feel like you're okay all the time and making sure that you never actually talk about that Jesus and the way he actually does have to heal you and teaching social justice exclusively, which social justice is fantastic, it's marvelous, but apart from the standard of justice, it'll never be compelling. And so that, that dynamic has been going on for so long that people are now leaving and we're seeing that happen with, um, well gosh, Josh Harris just left the church, I don't know if you guys saw that. Um, this morning we had one of the major writers for Hillsong United left. And we're seeing these major players go, I don't, this, what we've been teaching is absolutely nowhere near uh, anything exclusive. And it looks just like all the other religions, so why don't I just go with the one that I happen to feel like I like right now, and maybe I'll come back. Because they haven't met Jesus. So. I think one of the big fears with how the enemy is working is that it seems like it's easier if the church just kind of goes along with the culture instead of fighting against it. And instead of teaching this message, which will regularly rub you the wrong way, but it's rubbing you the wrong way because it's healing you, and healing sometimes hurts, right? Doesn't surgery sometimes hurt? When instead of doing that, we've we've started to water it down, and a watered down gospel doesn't save anybody. It's an altered gospel, and so we shouldn't be surprised when people don't want to be Christians. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Okay, hi. Um, so where do groups like the Amish and the Mennonites fit into all of this? Good question. <laughs> Would you rather be burned at the stake or uh, you know, or, or, or boiled, no. Um, Ravi Zacharias has this problem when he's asked about um, Roman Catholicism. So the Amish and the Mennonite teach a, a very, very severe form of legalism. Um, I would say very, very far away. And it's so severe a legalistic viewpoint, I'm afraid and I'm, I'm willing to die on this hill that they are not Christian denominations in spite of seeming that way sometimes, um, they ignore huge swaths of the scriptures. And that's never a good sign. But I think there's a great, you know, I, I, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of beauty in the lifestyle, but it's a lifestyle that won't save you. And it's the lifestyle that, that they insist will save you and that you must look this way. And there's, there's no amount of looking or living that will ever save you. The only thing that saves you is Christ. So if he's not there, then I don't think we should be there either. Does that answer your question? Okay. In a sci-fi kind of realm. Okay. If I love sci-fi. Let's say Paul could travel to the present time. Okay. And came to service. Would he recognize us teaching the same gospel that he's teaching? Golly, I hope so. Um, I like to think that if he's listening to one of my talks, he would. I think he'd think I'd look pretty funny. The answer is yes. He should identify in a Christian sense. Um, does that mean he's going to identify it in every church? No, I don't think so. Um, does that mean he's going to agree with all the people wearing the Christian label but not actually knowing anything about the gospel? He would not agree with them. Um, but I can tell you in this church, I feel very strongly that he would go, okay, this is cool, very high tech. I like it. Gospel, good. Talk to me about these cell phones. Those are pretty cool. But yeah, he would still identify. Would he feel comfortable taking communion? I think he'd have an agape meal with us, yes. Hello, uh, Anna. Right over here. Way over here. Hey. Hi. So <laughs> that's what I get for sitting on this far side. It's the, well, it's the lights that mess with me because right. my eyes f take a second to focus. And so like it's like a voice. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead. It's not creepy at all. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit briefly um, after service this morning, mm -hmm. and you know, I think a lot of us have um, either friends or family members who may be uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or, or uh, Mormon, and completely understanding that um, it is worth it, like to to take the risk. Yeah. Um, we're talking about eternity with these people that we love. Um, also recognizing their entire identity is wrapped up, and they're looking at sacrificing. Um, for lack of a better word, excommunication from their family. Yeah. Um, what's, I, I don't know if the word is like, what's the right approach? Um, understanding, it's, it's all got to be in do, done in love, obviously, but what's the right approach to start that conversation? 
um, when you're sitting down across, you know, from a family member and talking about faith um, yeah. or recognize a difference or a, a friend. Yeah. So in, in my experience, the thing that speaks to the most depth in a scenario like that is not to just shove a whole bunch of false prophecies in their face and be like, this guy's an idiot. Like, don't do that. Um, what you should do is make sure that they understand that the reason why you're there is because you are seeing someone who you believe without a shadow of a doubt has just taken spiritually a knife and run it up their arm. And you love them. And how could you possibly not talk to them about this? That's where you start. And a lot of times people talk, they, they fear about, you know, talking. They only see these people at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And they're like, so do I, you know, do I engage this at the supper table? My mom's going to kill me. She just wants it to be peaceful. And I always have to say, hey, look, if this is something that is met with contention regularly over that, over that interaction, you are allowed to stop as a Christian. You don't have to be unrelenting. Christ says that there comes a point where you are allowed to shake the dust from your feet. But until that point in time... We need to get our priorities straight. And if the only time you have access to these human beings, and presumably you don't, hopefully you have a phone and you can you know, get, it, get it together, but let's say you did, let's say the only time you have to speak to this human being is at the Christmas dinner, and it's gonna get awkward, how much more valuable is their having coffee with you in heaven than you ruining one Christmas dinner? We gotta do it. We have got to get over this cultural norm where we never talk about our Christianity because it's uncomfortable. You are worth a thousand uncomfortable conversations. You are worth me, you thinking that I'm absolutely insane for the rest of our lives if I get to talk to you about Jesus and you get to hear it. That's where we need to be as Christians. And it's, when, and it's there and it's in that emphasis that you then take something like the Book of Mormon, and you open it up and you say, this couldn't possibly be true. And if it were true, and you really do trust the testimony of a guy who went to jail for lying over exactly the same thing four years prior to the Book of Mormon being published, well then, why don't you use his translation of the Bible? Did you know that Joseph Smith did a translation of the Bible? Why doesn't the church use that? Is it maybe because we have the manuscripts and you can look at them and see that he was lying? This is a problem. And that's where you start that discussion. That's when you start bringing in the facts. But they need to see the love of God first, that desperate plead first, and then you can go, and you should go. Um, thank you so much for all of this. Yeah. I have an interesting question, and I don't... I'm hesitant to ask it because I would not want to upset anybody in the room. But when we're talking about extended books of the Bible and the Book of Mormon and the Watchtowers and all of those mm -hmm. things, where do the extra books that the Catholics study and place a large emphasis on mm -hmm. fall into all of this? Because at least in my common view and the things that I hope and pray for my family members that are Catholic, mm -hmm. they're included in the general bubble of Christianity. Right. So where do the differences lie in their extended books versus these other religions, alternative religions, mm -hmm. and their extended books, if that makes sense? Yes. So in, in, in the Roman Catholicism aspect, it's actually a little bit easier for us. And if you look at, I don't know, Grady, could you throw up that slide with the previous topics and where they are on the sermon, like the sermons and everything? If you go to that location that's about to be up there, night three is the Bible complete. We talk about all of those books. So if you want to review that, I, I highly recommend it. It's in podcast form, so you can listen to it in the car. Um, but with what we deal with with Catholicism, what they have is what's called the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonical text. Deuterocanonical means in between the canons, meaning what happens in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So with historical books like that, you don't need to be afraid of them in the same way that like the Book of Mormon is straight crazy. Because... The deuterocanonical text can actually be somewhat helpful. Where it becomes a problem is when they're set on the same level of scripture. That's when it becomes an issue. So if you're seeing them, read them because they're interested, great. If you're seeing them exclusively, read them 
and not anything else, that's probably a red flag. Um, but simply having them there is really not an issue unless they're ignoring what is the word of God or they're setting other things up at the level of the word of God. That's when you have to be upset. So always, always point them back to Jesus. And what's interesting, and I think I can still pull these. It's been a really long time since I did. We, I do have some quotes from the Pope's uh, referencing the fact that we probably shouldn't put the deuterocanonical text at the same level as the rest of the scriptures. Okay, yeah, my pleasure. Over here on your left. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks for what you're doing. Um, yes, ma'am. I do want to talk a little more, though, about um, when these people come to your door. Yes. Because there's actually scripture that says if someone comes teaching a false doctrine, you're not even supposed to allow them in your house. Right. And one of the problems is that most of us are not prepared while they're very well studied. Mm -hmm. And their doctrine is so close to what it sounds like it's so close to ours it's so very easy to get confused mm -hmm. um, in particular I had a Jehovah's Witness come to my door one time and she was pushing her Bible in my face saying see I believe Jesus is the son of God too because it says so right here mm -hmm. so there's that twisting so beyond just hey invite them in and evangelize them can you give some more you know suggestions on how we should approach them absolutely so with the Jehovah's Witnesses in particular, jump on eBay, it costs about $40, well worth it. This is called a kingdom interlinear. What this is, is the New World Translation, their altered Bible. This is what you'll get at the door if you ask for a New World Translation, it's called a silver sword. Um, some of the, I, I, technically I think they still had the black versions, which is the 1984 version the last time I was at the flea market, and you'll see them set up at the flea market regularly. <laughs> but if you ask for a New World Translation, yeah, those poor guys at the flea market, they really know me well. Um, <laughs> Um, the New World Translation Interlinear, you can pick up, it's purple. It has the Old and New Testament in Hebrew and Greek, and then the New World Translation uh, text on the right-hand side. All you have to do is open up to John 1.1, 1, 1, which says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But in their, t their scriptures, which is what Arianism does, is it takes out anything that would be any nod at Jesus being divine or Jesus being the second person of the Trinity, anything along those lines. And so their Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. I'm not sure why they think that gets around the issue, but they think it does. And the point here is that you know that. And so you very kindly are going to go pick up their material a New World Translation interlinear, and you're gonna to open to John 1.1, 1, 1, and you're gonna show them the Greek, and then you're gonna to point to the New World Translation text, because in the interlinear, the text says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you're gonna say, how exactly am I supposed to trust your Bible when your own material says that your Bible is wrong? Why don't we use my Bible? And then you're gonna grab your trusty New King James Version because that's a Bible that they're allowed to reference. And you're gonna say, it's okay. I've got one that your governing body says that you can use. Let's use that. You see what I'm doing? You're walking with them out instead of butting heads. And if you don't have a New King James Version, I'll give you one tonight, okay? Especially if you'll use it for the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Does that help you? Okay, my pleasure. Hey, Anna. Sam. Sam again. Um, I have a compound question. Oh, boy. So uh, that has to do with money. So one of the if things... If it gets too complicated and you're my student, I'm kicking you out. Okay. <laughs> so uh, a lot of times one of the hallmarks of a cult, right, is money. They want, they want your money somehow. Yeah. So how do you answer the accusation that that's all we want as well? Like you come to church, they pass the plate, we want tithes. Mm -hmm. um, and tacked into that, if you read the Bible, Jesus has um, a pretty simple lifestyle. It doesn't even appear that he even owned a home or anything. Uh, how do we square that against modern Christians where we've got multi-thousand dollar homes, multi-thousand yes. dollar cars? Um, how, how would you answer that style of question? Okay. I, I, would, I, always, I try to carry this too. Um, this is one of the original tracks for the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's called Millions Now Living Will Never Die. Um, and the reason why I carry it with me is because one of the things that they regularly do, cult groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and remember cult doesn't necessarily mean something bad, damaging cult means something bad. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, try not to use the term cult when you're 
talking to a Jehovah's Witness because that can tend to turn them off a little bit. Um, but we can because we're in a community night and we're, we're discussing theology and that's important that we keep that distinction clear. But the reason why I keep it with me is because the old, the old cost for tracks are in it. And a lot of times they've never seen anything like this and they are under the impression that um, money is not a part of what they do and that's a total lie. Um, so when you come to actual Christianity and the process of tithing, for example, tithing in Christianity is a type of ministry. It is something that we are asked to do in obedience to God because we recognize as Christians that the money does not belong to us, it belongs to him. And what we are asking of him is clarification over why he put us in the body that he did, why he put us in the location that we did, right? You didn't pick to be you in America, in Maryville, Tennessee. He chose that option for you. And so a lot of times our ministry is through finances. He has tasked some people to be financially successful in a way to advance the church. It's not about self. And so you can agree with them when they start complaining about Christians who see it as their money being, having to be asked for by church officials. Okay, that's not, that's not how it works and they're not being biblical. Um, and then you can go to the scriptures where it talks about the people of God are supposed to see themselves in the light of ministry workers, full-time ministry workers, and stewards. We're supposed to work together. And the reason we're supposed to work together is because, as God points out, stewards have been tasked with the extra responsibility of putting missionaries in the field, of putting full-time speakers on this, in this regard out there for the advancement of the gospel. And in so doing, they have been blessed in the sense that God is going to credit them. This is Philippians chapter four, if you wanna lock it up. That God is going to credit the stewards who placed their finances in order to get the gospel out to pay for the cost of living for these individuals. God is going to credit everything that missionary does to their account. And it's why we work together. Missionaries and church workers need stewards. Stewards need missionaries. We're both important. So we should never be looking at our role in the church as like that Christian up there give, speaking from the pulpit is like a super Christian and I'm just kind of down here. That's not how any of this works. And it's not accurate and it's not biblical. Does that make sense? So we're constantly clarifying because the Christian position is not about begging for money. The Christian position is everything belongs to God and I'm being obedient with what he's tasked with me with. The issue is obedience. Okay, I have kind of a short story and then the question follows. Great. I love um, stories. I had an encounter with a lady that I go to the gym with. And I would see her every day. We'd wave, hi, how, how are you? You know, every mm -hmm. day we'd speak. And so I'd say like a couple of months into it, uh, we were both, you know, in the, in the women's room. And we sat down and we was having a conversation. And uh, somehow we started talking about our faith, our beliefs. And she uh, told me she was a Muslim. And I told her I was a Christian. And so I was like, what exactly do, do you all believe? Because, you know, I don't know. I didn't know much about it. And so she, I think she told me that she didn't believe in Jesus or uh, something to that state. And so I got into my faith and I said, you know, I told her, I said, well, Jesus loves you, you know. And I said, you know, you open up your heart to him. Don't close your heart to him. And, you know, I just talked to her about the love of God. And so from that point forward, she didn't speak. She didn't look at me. She didn't wave. And so my question is, how soon should you have a conversation um, about your faith or, you know, with someone uh, of another faith without running them off? Are you worried you did something wrong? Yeah, I, I, I questioned myself. You didn't. You didn't do anything wrong. Um, in Islam, Jesus is a prophet and he's just a man. Um, and Jesus is gonna come back and uh, everybody's going to be resurrected and then Jesus is going to go through this whole battle with us and all these things. He's gonna die and he's gonna be entombed next to Muhammad, which is why where Muhammad is laying right now, his body, there's an empty tomb next to him. That's reserved for when Jesus comes back. Um, 
the issue in Islam, especially when you start talking about Jesus, she's not rejecting you. She's rejecting the possibility of you continuing, continuing to evangelize because if she's caught or if she's observed talking about Christianity, she has done something that could be interpreted as extremely bad and in a way that could end up becoming disciplinary. So there was never a point in time where you would have been able to have that conversation that would not have resulted in that. So you can rest in the thought that you haven't done anything wrong. And in fact, that may have been the only encounter she's gotten about Jesus. That's a good thing. Um, what you've also done is earmark yourself as a safe space. So even if she never comes back to you, you have set up that when she sees you, if she ever does need to talk about something like that, you're her first go-to, right? Just stay kind. Know that she may never talk to you again, and that's okay. But that she needs to see from you a kindness and the invitation of Christ, which is constant. And that's a good thing. But I'm sorry you had to feel that, that pain of that you may have done something wrong. There's no such thing as doing something wrong when it comes to evangelizing. I think we'll do one, maybe two more questions. We're okay. probably in our last uh, five or to ten minutes at the mm -hmm. most here, so we okay. can try to be honoring of everyone's time. Um, there's probably a lot more than one or maybe two questions left in the room, um, and Anna is not going to uh, leave. Yeah, if I mean, you had, she'll if, leave eventually, but not. I mean, I sleep here. Imminently. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, and if you have a question that is too intimate to talk about out loud, I will be here afterwards when everything's cut off, and you can talk to me then too. Okay, you're more than welcome. Anna, um, you've talked about counseling people who mm -hmm. have come out of captivity. Yes. For lack of a better term. Yes. Um, That's a great term. So I have a friend who has liberated herself out of. Um, corruption, but um, she has trust issues like so many do, and she loves my family explicitly. She stayed in our home. She seeks me out when she's at her darkest moments. Excellent. Um, but to get her in this room wouldn't happen. Okay, that's okay. How? What do I do? Yeah. We. What? I pray and love on her. Yeah. But. I know that's not enough for her life because the world is, for her, so tempting because she was in such captivity. It's like that rum springa, kind of that now we're going to go all the way the other way mm -hmm. yeah. because I was locked in a dark room mm -hmm. while my father um, molested me. Oh, my gosh. And this is a man who spoke Christianity. Yeah. It wasn't Jehovah's Witness. It was a twist. Mm -hmm. And those nightmares mm -hmm. haunt her literally nightly. Yeah. So what's the best for me to do for her? First, what you're doing is enough. Don't ever beat yourself up about that. Because you're not, that, the healing process can take a very long time, and it's a good thing. Because healing in too quick can sometimes be false, or it's not a good, remember how I talk about I like surgery stuff, and I'm, I'm in the medical thing. What happens when you close a wound that's too deep, and you go too fast? It bursts right back open again. A lot of times what God is doing is healing, actual healing, which takes a very long time. And what you're doing is setting yourself up as the opposite to what she encountered with her dad. This is what she thought Christianity was. She has a claimant for Christianity over here. Then she has a claimant for Christianity over here. And what she's seeing is that somebody is wrong. And I don't know who that person's going to be. And the long, longer you can demonstrate to her that you are trustworthy, that you are safe, that you are there, that you are the authentic representation, of what is in this book, what you are doing is literally setting yourself up as against what she experienced. And there will come a point in time where she recognizes, okay, maybe he was wrong. Maybe that wasn't Christianity. And maybe I can try this again. And that's okay if it takes time. 
prayer is absolutely crucial and it's the number one thing that you can be doing right now. But then making yourself available to her in those dark moments and continually pointing back to Christ. That's all you gotta do. We don't save anybody. We're just here. We talk about the person who saves people and he does the work and we're patient while he does it. So keep going. That's perfect. Um, okay, we will be back here mm-hmm. September 8th. So that's roughly a month from today, four weeks from today. The topic? The topic is going to be, what is the Trinity? If God the Father is God and Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is God, then isn't that three gods? I thought we only believed in one God, Aaron. Mm-hmm. What is the Trinity? Why don't we ever talk about it? How do we explain it to people? That's mm-hmm. what we're covering. And you're going to solve it, right? Like resolve the tension forever? Totally. <laughs> completely. <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Let Anna know that you're thankful. Yeah, I'm really thankful. Thank hang out for questions. Hang out with each other. We love you. We'll see you later. Yeah, drive safe.